see, I don't know if my pointer works, probably not. Um, but you can see the original stand is this single story stand that's uniformly spaced. Um, and what you do with a shelter with is you remove some of the overstory, you leave some so that that provides a seed source and it shelters, um, it still provides enough light for the understory for those trees to regenerate, but it protects those things the new regeneration from things like um, wind and, and other things it ameliorates the harsh conditions. Once you get regeneration established, you come in and you remove that overstory and you leave that um, regeneration and that results in a in an even age stand again. This takes several um, so that initial cut would be like the prep cut. Um, then that seed cut is an establishment cut, and then you remove the overstory. This can take several decades to do, depending on how fast you get the regeneration and come in. You can do that um, when you have a uniformly spaced uh, stand, or if you have uh, another way of looking at it is you can clump it. Um, if you're if you don't have a uniform stand, you can do it in a way that you uh, remove clumps of trees to get that same um, output or outcome with that removal cut. If you are in a really windy area, basically you can still do a shelter wood, um, but you want to stagger those cuts out and it will take a little bit longer, uh, a few more decades to do that because you want to make sure those, those overstory trees don't fall down. The other thing why I mentioned two or three stories, um, those are when you have um, those are when you have either lodgepole in the overstory and in the midstory. It's the same outcome. You remove some of the trees, <coughs> you'll get an even age stand out of that. You can do that uniformly or with clumps. Um, but then also, if you have a multi story stand um, which has um, shade intolerant species in them, um, there's several different options you can do. You can remove the overstory in the first cut and do a thin from below, which you're removing all the shade intolerant species in the understory and then allow the lodge pole to establish. Or you can just um, not even remove any of that overstory in the beginning and just um, do both of them at the same time. And then lastly, the other thing that works with uh, lodge pole pine is uneven age management. What we usually do is to do uneven age management, this will give you different age structures on the landscape is uh, called group selection. Um, basically, that is when you're taking certain, take your landscape or your, or your or a large enough stand and you just remove pockets of the overstory. You don't make them very large because you want the seeds to come in and, and start it, but you can imagine it's a lot of little holes on the landscape with different age structures um, in them. So those are sort of the, the big um, overstory kind of removal kind of uh, civil cultural techniques we use. In between those things, between when you get an established stand and then you come in for your next cycle, we often do these things, what we call intermediate treatment. That happens because logical life, as Jonathan mentioned, logical likes to regenerate really dense. And so when you have a dense forest like this, um, you can allow them to grow, but they are taking up too much space. Think about if you planted a garden of tomatoes and you planted 100 seeds and they all germinated. You wouldn't let all hundred of them grow. You want to take some of those out. So we often do that early in the early in the development of that stand uh, with pre-commercial thinning uh, to release some of those trees that are that are there um, to grow into bigger trees. This does um, this is called pre-commercial because it actually costs money to do it, but in the long run, you end up with better um, space trees and trees that are going to grow faster. In other cases, we might do some commercial thins. So if you have a really dense stand, a lot of material can be merchantable. You remove some of that and you can get more open stands. Um, and these are then going to be available soon to uh, remove, whether you want to do the shelter wood or clear cut or um, that group selection as well. And I just wanted to point out, we've been doing these type of research um, on cut in logical for a very long time. These are some pictures from Fraser Experimental Forest up on the Arapahoe Roosevelt um, from the 1940s, uh, doing some long term research that we're still measuring this, uh, this stuff for growth and yield and, and other, other values. And the last thing I want to bring up 
Unless I don't have time. Am I good on time? No. We're going to just run through the presentation. So go ahead, okay. Mike. The other thing that um, there's some other treatments that we might want to do in logical, and one of them is reducing crown fire hazards, especially in, in the wildland urban interface. And, and it's, it's one of those things where, you know, from an ecological point of view, um, logical pine a lot of times burned as a crown fire. And so this doesn't always line up with the ecological um, framework of logical pine, but when you have houses embedded in this, sometimes you want to do some things that would reduce your, your hazard of crown fire in certain areas. And so, <laughs> Ways to address that, um, what we often do is first we uh, address the crown base height issue. Crown base height is basically that, that forest there, I assume it's on your left, yeah, um, has a really low crown base height. So if you imagine a fire that's going through that sand, and, 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 um, it wouldn't take a lot of wind for the fire to get up into those crowns. Whereas on the, the one on the right, the forest on the right, you can see it's very, there's a very big gap between those surface fuels and the overstory. And so it would take a lot of wind in order to carry a crown fire through that. And that might be one thing you might do, um, maintain really tall crown base height um, in a fuel mitigation um, standpoint, from fuels mitigation standpoint. The other thing is removing the, the, the amount of fuel that can burn. So we, we often refer to that as canopy bulk density. You can see the one on the left has a lot of foliage in a small compact area, whereas the one on the right, it will take a lot of energy for a fire to, to jump from crown to crown because it just has less foliage uh, that's able to burn. And of course, breaking up the continuity. And this is where those different age class structures or different treatments such as shelter woods or clear cuts or group selections break up that canopy continuity. So even if you had a, um, a fire that was uh, burning through these stands, if they weren't continuous across thousands of acres, you can have breaks in your forest and have some um, situations where you'd have surviving, surviving forest, or if you needed to do some suppression activities, um, having that canopy uh, broken up would be really uh, beneficial. And then lastly, we want to talk about different kinds of surface fuels and dealing with those surface fuels. Um, you know, when you have a grass fuel bed, um, that typically happens when you have a really open stand. Um, fire's gonna move really fast through that. When you have a lot of activity fuels like that in the middle, um, that can generate a lot of heat um, and a lot of uh, tall frame, uh, frame length, as well as a lot of coarse woody debris. This picture on the bottom is actually a picture of an area that's been hit by beetles um, and there's a lot of of course, fuel on the ground where you might not have a crown fire, but if these logs did catch on fire, it'd be really difficult to control that. We call that resistance control. Um, you could have really severe, um, high, high severity surface fire, uh, which may or may not be something that um, you desire, especially if it's near your home. And the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, and I already said that one. Um, is dwarf mistletoe. And, and Jonathan brought this up. And um, these are pictures of what dwarf mistletoe might look like. This stand here with the overstory and the understory under it that has um, these brooms of dwarf mistletoe on them, that's not an ideal situation. And the reason why is mistletoe spits out its seed. It doesn't spit, it projects it, projects it. And it goes, if you can imagine, all those trees that are in the overstory to have mistletoe are going to affect all that regeneration and then that, then that will have mistletoe and if your objective is not to have mistletoe, um, this is a, a structure that you would not want to um, um, perpetuate. And then this is my last slide. Um, I wanted to show you this picture. This is on the Fraser Experimental Forest. We call it the Red Hand of Death. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is from the mountain pine beetle uh, epidemic that happened last like 10 years ago. And what you're seeing right there is the areas that are red, uh, this was an experiment uh, that they installed in, in the 60s and 70s. The areas that were green were areas which were clear cuts or strip cuts, strip clear cuts. 
Um, and then the areas that are red were the intact forest. And basically what, what I wanted to show you this picture was, is that by, by them doing the treatment 30, 40 years ago, the age structure of this landscape was different and the size of those trees were different enough that the beetles didn't mess with the young forest. They only attacked the forest that was of the right size. And what, this, what this is demonstrating is if you have um, a diversity of size and age classes on your landscape, you can still maintain some forest cover. Um, those, those areas that are red right now are going to be able to be seeded in by the areas that were not big enough to hit, um, be hit by Mount Pine Beetle. And so that's one of those reasons why we talk about diversification of, of the forest and landscape. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. And I'm sorry I went over a little bit. <laughs> Melanie's here and she's the tech expert, so I'm passing that duty off to her. But does anybody have any questions for Mike? Is he talking about this forest specifically or is he talking in general? My understanding is in general. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, that. all these techniques that I was talking about can be applied in the Keller um, Park area and in logical mines um, specifically. Well, my real question is, is there an objective in Taylor Park and who determined it? And we'll get into that in the presentation with Matt. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Matt, or Mike. Yep. <laughs> Lots of them. Thank you. So then that cues us up to have Art, who is going to take it from some of the, we've had presentations on some of the fundamentals of forest ecology and silviculture. Um, Art has been here on the forest for how long now? 38 years. 38 years. So he'll have a lot of the um, local knowledge on the ground that we've heard some of the questions asked so far. And let's see for the presentation. We had all the pictures downloaded. Give me a second to provide. It looks like they're all on there. And there's an X button. Let me make this all the stuff at the top go away. We have tried. Let's see. Can you minimize the screen for a second? Are the desktops the same? Let's click on that one. Three dots up there, and then slideshow. Okay, and then you should be able to just click through. Okay. And folks from afar, are you seeing the screen shared? Can we make it stop? Yeah. Yep. I can see it. We can see it. Okay. All right. I'm gonna have to. Don't use slideshow. Just uh, just put the uh, images up because I can click through the mouse. Okay. Okay, should be able to do this. Okay, um, I guess my talk is about the historical aspect of what has mankind been doing in Taylor Park uh, since uh, mankind's been here. Well, we showed up in the 1880s, late 1870s, and we started cutting trees. First place we used to, were going to were uh, around the mining camps, places like Tin Cup, 
and um, we are cutting trees locally and using them locally. Uh, just outside of Pitkin, or not Pitkin, but Tin Cup, this is uh, northwest of town, up above Rainbow Subdivision. Here's an old pile of logs I found up there, and it was attached to this uh, structure in the middle, which is it's dirt on top of decked logs. And what they were doing is in 1883, which is what I dated the trees in, on this site to, was they were putting down logs into there, covering it with dirt, or lighting it with fire, covering it with dirt, and then they were growing, um, uh, or they're producing charcoal to be used as fuel in town. Um, we started cutting um, commercial saw timber, uh, excuse me, let me backtrack. Uh, we also cut post of poles for fence posts, uh, for fences, for corrals, uh, mine props for the mines in the Taylor Park base. We really didn't import wood or export wood. We just used the wood that was there for the mining uh, operations and for the ranching operations. Uh, we didn't start commercial saw timber logging in Taylor Park until 1970, no, 1967. 67, we had several large Engelman spruce clear cuts, green clear cuts at the top of Rocky Brook and Trail Creek. Uh, this is later than many areas on the district because we didn't have the transportation infrastructure to get the wood out from Taylor Park Basin, as opposed to uh, along Tamichi Creek down here, uh, Quartz Creek, um, the East River, where we had railroad infrastructure. We can get the logs down in what was called the tie hack to the railroads, and we can move those logs to Kansas or Oklahoma for fence poles, uh, telephone poles, uh, all sorts of different products. Um, in about the 1973, we started more and more work in lodgepole pine. Uh, this is uh, from the late, uh, you no, know, this is about 1981 when this was cut. Um, another stand that was cut in the late 70s. This one was broadcast burned, so they found they had to plant it because they burned up all their seed. And the, the trees are planted. These last two sites are under contract to be pre-commercially thinned this year. They're 35, 38 years old. So we're gonna thin them. Uh, this is what we're trying to get. We're trying to get the cones on the grounds. So we get little tr trees uh, from the seed that's being dispersed. Uh, we found that uh, yeah, you might have serotonous cones, but you get them on the ground, that sun will beat down on them, warm them up, and they will open up. So a typical pattern is that we leave the trees, leave the cones on the ground for one summer to open up. Um, we have we had a lot of non-commercial stands in Taylor Park that we identified, okay, it's got dwarf mistletoe, let's just start trying to clean some of the stuff, start over, and get new stands going again. So in 1981 to 1983, we had real good funding from uh, Forest Health to regenerate dwarf mistletoe infested stands, get young, good trees started again. Um, and then we also had in 1983, Congress passed the Jobs Bill Act which we were given a lot of money to do mechanized site preparation work and uh, hand uh, pre-commercial thinning to create jobs for people who are unemployed because the economy in 83 was not that good. This particular project area here is between Texas Creek and Illinois Creek. This was part of a uh, Carl State University research study by Tom Zimmerman and uh, is it Ron Laven? I can't remember. Uh, but we got in some really nasty dog hair, almost post dog hair, 
lodgepole pine with mistletoe. You can see how much fuel's laying on the ground in here. Uh, and we put fire through that uh, one summer afternoon. And dwarf mistletoe being uh, that it has these brooms on it, uh, burns pretty aggressively and it will take it into the crowns and burn through a, a overstory. This could be the genesis for a crown fire in a windy condition. We had other areas, we didn't have all that much fuel in the ground, but we had dog hair, lodgepole pine. This, these are trees that are so old, so dense, they will never release and be thinnable. Or they, you can thin them, but they won't release and they won't grow. So, and they have mistletoe. So we went through and started to do uh, non-commercial stand replacements on uh, some of these uh, old decadent disease stands. A lot of the stuff was only about this big around. So we put dozers in, we machine trampled it. Uh, we found that after machine trampling, the stuff would come popping back up. Uh, we got a big old uh, Barden 12 foot wide uh, roller chopper drum told that behind a D8. Uh, that drum probably weighs about 18,000 pounds because it's filled with water. You can get things to crush down and break up. This is kind of what it looks like. You got all that dog here now is a bit about like that. And no soil disturbance because the dozer and the drum were riding on top of the stuff. Uh, we tried multiple different techniques. We Machine trampled it first, we chopped it first, we double chopped it, uh, trampled and uh, trampled and roller chopped it. We tried all sorts of different combinations to make things work. And then after two years, this is up in Pie Plant Creek, this is two years after a roller chop treatment. Uh, I would like to go up there and see if I can find the site again and get some pictures of it. Uh, since we had all that fuel mass on the ground and we weren't getting any soil disturbance or the cones to get down onto the soil and to regen or kick their seed out so we get regeneration, uh, we also went through machine trampled and piled uh, in these areas. Okay, now one of the things we did have that we were concerned with is fire, landscape fires. The year before I came here, 1980, we had the Spring Creek burn. It burns down here immediately. <coughs> we salvage cut as much as practical, looking down into Taylor River. Uh, this is from, if anybody was familiar with Taylor Park, this is from what's now the Taylor Park Raw Station. Um, the fire burned to the river. And then this back over here was a spot fire, about 60 acre size spot fire that they just happened to have the dozers sitting on the road and a couple hand crews on buses that just rolled in and they were able to get in there and catch that. This is the Red Mountains Summer Home Group right here. So um, the residents who live in the summer home group were kind of concerned about fires. We did we put in some fuel breaks. This would have been in 1987. We went through machine trampled, prepared the site. Uh, you can see how we rolled over the trees, let it dry out, and then we got in there and we put some fire into it. A night broadcast burning. We did it at night to keep the severity down and to control the amount of spot fires that we would get out of these broadcast burn units. We burned something like about 128 acres over about three nights. Uh, pretty dramatic, some places pretty intense fire, uh, didn't have any problems with control. Uh, we had several other broadcast night broadcast burns in the Taylor Park Basin that we followed up on. This is all non-commercial treatment. 
this is the next day after that first night. You can see there's you know, still quite a bit of uh, heavy debris on the ground, but the fine stuff is burned off. Um, I've got about four rolls of slides, and this is just what I could pick up this morning. Uh, so I should have some other slides in there. Okay, Taylor Park. This is 1980, 1978. This is Trail Creek, Taylor River. The Summer Home Group, 1978, 1988, this is Spring Creek Burn, this is Spot Fire, here's the Summer Home Group, and you can see where we did the standing, uh, we took care of the stands non-commercially around it, so we have some fuel breaks in the area. Uh, other things we were doing, this was originally roller chop units in 1981, and then 1991-93, I came in and uh, had postal pole sales. We got those strips cut out there to pull the dwarf mistletoe seed source back away from these young regenerated trees. This is a 1995 image. Well, we can get uh, lodgepole pine pretty successfully after clear cutting or other treatments in Taylor Park. This is nice, good stuff. We like nice, clean, young trees. And we like to be able to grow them actually a little bit thick to train the trees so that they grow up taller and be better tr trees for saw timber production down the road. But we want to keep the dwarf mistletoe seed that is in these kind of trees away from the good stuff. So we put in uh, uh, edge strip clear cuts, which is uh, part of the proposal for uh, this uh, project to keep the mistletoe away from the young trees. In some places, um, you have spruce and fir. Okay, we can take care of the mistletoe up to the edge of the spruce and fir, then we don't have to go any further because there's no mistletoe in there. So we've protected young stuff on the inside there, uh, and we're just motoring on. Uh, where we have stem, we have stand conditions where we have saw timber available. Uh, that's not the best saw timber in the world, Norm. Um, we can get in and clear cut, uh, but we still have a lot of woody debris on the ground. And we're not able, the seed is not accessing bare mineral soil in this condition. This is winter logged up in, this is Pipe Plant Creek, Illinois Creek Timber Sale. You can see my hard hat just how thick that woody debris is in there. So we got a dozer in there and machine piled. It was more of a spot machine piling. We didn't need to treat the entire area. You can see how down below we got mineral soil exposed. But we don't have to treat, treat the entire area because there's areas out here that there's not all that much woody debris and we did get the soil disturbance during the harvest. But we got the bulk of the volume out of the way. Okay, then we can come in when safe in the wintertime, unlike summertime, nighttime burns, and we can burn the piles. We don't get the smoke uh, generation issues. The piles burn pretty cleanly. Um, there's only smoke for the first few minutes of a burn, <coughs> uh, unlike a uh, the broadcast burns where you generated a tremendous amount of smoke that gets stuck in the basin pretty bad. Uh, natural fire. Uh, these are 1939 aerial photographs. And you can look at the different patterns of trees in here. Pretty young stand, pretty tight canopy. And you get up here and there's a different stand condition there. And down over here, you can see where fires have gone through, but not regenerated very well. Down in here, 
Uh, I probably should have got a image of uh, the 2015 NAIP to compare this with. You can see a lot has changed, a lot of fill in in these stands over time. <coughs> Similar area. Uh, this is now filled in. Part of this has been pre commercially thinned. This has been pre commercially thinned. Uh, we've done, been doing commercial thinning in this stand over here um, since before I came here. Uh, this is stage stop metals. Cottonwood Pasture runs across the top of that. Um, recognizing that there has been fire on the landscape for a long time, somebody was asking what the fire return interval uh, for the Taylor Park Basin is. The basin itself down low is 30 to 50 years based on the research of Colorado State University. Um, typically what they were thinking is that uh, the first two burns be pretty light under burns it wouldn't take out the overstory. It would just kind of fumble through, kind of kill some trees, get a little bit more fuel on the ground, open it up, the dwarf mistletoe would spread more. And if in the third burn, it would take the entire stand and regenerate. So here, this is on the north side of Taylor Canyon, north of North Bank Campground. And this was, uh, after, I think, I'm going to say mid 80s, we had, we brought in a hill torch. And we actually hill, hill, helicopter ignited this area. The objective for this area was not timber production. You can't get there from here. This is for bighorn sheep habitat. Uh, for the migrating herd between Almont Triangle and heading up on the north side of the canyon. Uh, this is a 1995 uh, burn in that same area. Uh, you can see how during this this go around, we've got places that are, trees are scorched, and then we have some areas that we're getting active uh, torching in, but it's not carrying all the way through. We just get scorched, and yet we still have places where there's no not hardly any kind of burning at all. It's a very mixed severity type burn. Uh, to date, we've burned about 9,500 acres on the north side of uh, Taylor County, from uh, North Bank Campground up to Bachelors Mountain. And I think that's pretty much my presentation. Okay. Um, questions on kind of the history of this area. I have a question, Mark. Okay. Um, you showed the roller chopping and all those. Yeah. I don't. I don't notice us doing that anymore. Is that just a past practice? That was a past practice. That we just really didn't like what we were getting, and that's why that roller chopper sat out of ropers for twenty years. It has been taken away for scrap. Uh, it just left too much woody debris on the ground and it really didn't do anything for reforestation. Plus you couldn't get all the trees uh, that had mistletoe killed on that site. Uh, you'd go back in and you'd have green trees popping up or sneaking up through the uh, woody debris and they'd have mistletoe. But logical pine is very tenacious. Or, we got a question. Um, heard uh, the phrase dog hair used quite a bit. Um, yeah. And I, I think the, the reaction to that phrase is, tends to be bad usually. But if I'm hearing you correctly, is dog hair almost the natural state of a lodgepole forest? Yes. It, it's, a, it's a condition where if you get above about 300 stems per acre, uh, say after a broadcast burn or wildfire, you get so many trees so close together, they're competing with each other. And in some of these stands, over 3,000 trees per acre, they won't grow beyond 12 to 15 foot tall because they just cannot get enough energy out of the soil, nutrients and moisture out of the soil or sunlight. So they're just competing with each other. And then if you throw a mistletoe on top of that, it, 
it's pretty much a mess. If, do you think if you went back to 1850, say, it would probably be the same thing? You'd have the, the large-scale burns come in and then dog hair come up? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, dwarf mistletoe-infested dog hair out east of here that came from the 1854 uh, historic burn. And that's up on the south side of Chemichi Creek from, say, from Barrett Creek, Needle Creek Reservoir to over Marshall Pass. There's a lot of ground in there. And once it gets into that dog hair stagnated state, you really can't thin it and get it to release. It just won't take. Um, so you're actually waiting to have, wasting taxpayer dollars on thinning it. If you get in thin it fairly early, you can keep the trees growing. And then we can get 14, 16 inch trees at the rotation, which is our, from saw timber management perspective, is what we want to have. Yeah. So our uh, dwarf mistletoe has been a part of the for, uh, Trader Park Forest since, who knows? Since Lodgepole Pine. Yeah. It, it moved here with the Lodgepole Pine okay. from, uh, well, after the last ice age, a lot of these tree species, particularly lodgepole pine with its mistletoe, uh, migrated north out of Central America. Uh, so what does move a lot faster than what the trees and the mistletoes spread past what people might want to realize. Um, but we also had fire at the same time, and we weren't trying to grow trees for sawtip. Um, I think there was uh, quite a bit of uh, evidence of anthropological uh, ignitions, either accidental or deliberate. Uh, <coughs> there certainly was a lot of burning in between 1860, 1850, uh, into the 1890s. Uh, <coughs> our Native American peoples, when they were kicked out, they tried to pursue a scorched earth policy from Lake City South. And then the miners, the early miners, particularly the placer miners, liked to burn things off because then they could see the soil and see if there's any gold down there for the placer mining. Placer mining is big in Taylor Park. There's hundreds and hundreds of miles of ditches and washes up there. So there, there was a lot of burning <clears throat> as occurred in the past. Um, Cone serotony. Somebody asked about cone serotony. In the main Tater Park Basin, it's probably two-thirds closed and one-third open. As you get up an elevation into where you get more Engelman spruce, you shift from that 30, 50-year fire return interval to more of the classical 200 to 300-year fire return interval. You're picking up more and more Engelman spruce, and the lodgepole pine is more open cone in those habits. Um, what I find pretty universally throughout the Gunnison Basin is that young trees up to about 60 years old tend to have tend to have more open cones. Then they go close cones when the canopy's close. And then when they get old, up 160, 200 years old, the stands are starting to fall apart and those cones open back up again. Uh, that's just kind of a pattern I've seen in the age classes. Other questions? Or... Any others? I hope I didn't. How did I do? <laughs> well, um, so I grossly under <clears throat> underestimated the amount of time our presenters needed to get their information across. So we have veered off from the agenda. And so we are now at 545. And so I say we take a 15 minute break to stretch our legs. Um, and then we'll come back for Matt and Clay uh, to run through more of the specifics about the upcoming project. Feel free to ask questions to the presenters during the break or myself if you um, have anything that you think of during that time. And we'll circle back at six. So <laughs> 
And for those who snuck in after we started, there is a sign in in the back. So if you would make sure we've got your name and contact information, that will help us as we're moving forward with future project details. I can tell. <laughs>
looks like an internal okay. meeting. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, all right. Okay. I didn't cut you out. Well, have everyone had a nice break? Um, my name is Matt McCombs. I'm the district ranger on the Gunnison Ranger District, and I'll be the uh, what's called the deciding official for this analysis and um, and ultimately responsible for the planning process and for the, as long as I'm the district ranger, the implementation of the planning process as well. So uh, we want to, um, and then I'll let Clay introduce himself as well. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is Clay Spees. I'm the re 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 Renewable Resource Staff Officer here on the Jimmy QG National Forest, and uh, I've been involved with the Spudmere Project for a number of years. So I'm here to answer questions you might have. So, we're, and we'll talk a little bit about what. Raise your hand if you know what Spedmere stands for. Stands not everybody. <laughs> Do, raise your hand if you know what it is in concept. All right. So, uh, the spruce beetle came in, and we had some. Uh, so Aspen declined as well, and the forest did a broad scale environmental impact statement, which uh, took an adaptive management approach to treating those spruce stands as, as well as um, where we had opportunities treating Aspen decline as well. So when we talk about Spedmere, um, that's primarily dealing with um, spruce forests on the district. And um, this project is very much a complement to Spedmere. And what Spedmere stands for, let's see if I can get it right, is the Spruce Beetle Epidemic Aspen Decline Management Response, um, which was a, essentially a collaboratively, collaboratively developed pro, um, project that is now um, the benefit, is the benefactor of a, an adaptive management group, which is a group of interested parties as well as a science team of scientists that have interests in the, the project that is helping with the implementation of the project and also helping with the monitoring of the project. And it's engaging citizens and interested stakeholders in ways that the Forest Service has not very, done very effectively in the past. And often we engage with the public um, on the front end, and there's not so much engagement on the back end. We just sort of go out about our business and implement the projects that we planned. Um, and this adaptive management group um, that's working with these spruce beetle um, focus, spruce stand focus treatments is, is engaging the public in a whole new way and also helping us fine tune the way we implement and, and, and keeping us honest about um, making sure that we use the best management practices and the design and the criteria that we put into the design of the project um, that we use it effectively and, and then also provides us opportunities to make changes um, as we move along. So what I got here about a year and a half ago this project was somewhat underway, but not fully launched. And coming up to speed, it became very apparent to me that we had a great model um, in the Spedmere process that we could apply to this Taylor Park project, recognizing that we are planning at scale over the planning area is about 250,000 acres, and that we're proposing to treat at scale um, roughly 15,000 acres. Um, so just a little context about sort of how we got to the, the process that we, um, or to the, the point that we are today. Now, I had hoped that um, perhaps rather, uh, well, I would say naive would be the word, but just I had high hopes. I was a big optimist that the way that we designed the project would be somewhat um, uh, suitable to, to, the, to the needs of the people, that people would generally be like, yeah, the way you propose this project, Matt, and the scoping notes we'll talk about in a minute, uh, and, and the design of the project was, was perfect. And we are really just interested in helping you implement effectively. Well, it turns out that's not always gonna, you know, the public isn't always completely in alignment with the, uh, the proposal as it's first brought to the table. And so at our first meeting, um, when was that in December? Mm -hmm. There was a strong desire and based on some of the feedback from the public, there's a strong desire to take a step back and, and re-engage the interested stakeholders and members of the community uh, as we continue to develop the project prior to it being finalized, but also stay very focused on developing an adaptive management group similar to what we have for Spedmayor, but more focused in the Taylor Park area that will help us in the implementation process and help us in the monitoring process and also help us importantly, very much importantly to me in the sharing of the story process. Because um, you just had a lot of information, you know, and if 
dumped into the room here. And if you don't have some basic fundamentals, understanding of forestry or the history of forestry or the history of the forest service or the history of the area, it's not a, a, an easy uh, thing to piece all together. When you talk about the silvics and the ecology and the history, um, and now I'm going to try to, in a somewhat brief period of time, talk about why we're even proposing this project here and why we're proposing it now and what is some of the rationale behind it. Um, and I think if you engage through this adaptive management group, and I keep coming back to this because eventually through these workshops, we're hoping to identify folks that will want to participate in the long run. Um, what I've found through the SPEDMIR AMG is that the folks that have been participating throughout the years have become incredibly savvy, so many of them with no background in the science or application of forestry, but they've become incredibly savvy about the potential about, of forestry and its application on, on public lands. And to me, that's very, very exciting because we have not always had, outside of uh, our foresters, um, a robust understanding of why we do what we do and why there's a tree you know, in the middle of the patch. Um, and so that's just a little precursor to, to the discussion. So what I want to do is talk, I can't really walk you through the project because there, there's a substantial, or in, in total, but there's a substantial amount of information. But what I did want to show you is that um, in the link, if you, if you were invited to this by um, our folks here at the Center for Public Lands at Western, if you were invited, there was a link in that reminder that came to you, and it takes you right to this page, which is the project record um, to date for the Taylor Park Environmental Assessment. And um, the first thing that you'll see there is the scoping letter. So scoping is really um, when the Forest Service through this, our environmental analysis process, we want to kind of better understand, we, we think we understand the scope of the project, but we want to give the public an opportunity to help us uh, define and refine the scope of the project. So all of the issues, concerns, and opportunities that might exist within uh, the planning area or the different outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So the first thing you do is you, you click on this letter from me um, that uh, speaks about the background in Taylor Park as far as the ecology and some of the um, forestry applications that have occurred in the past, and then you get down to the purpose and need. And that's what I'm going to re reference here just for a minute. And I know you're all going to read it because you can't help yourselves. Um, but I'm going to talk about it so a little bit more in, in generalities. Um, the Forest Service for, well, so I guess the basics. Number one, we want to complement the incredible work that's been done through the SPEDMIR process. We've been able to treat more acres at scale than perhaps any other time in the history of the GMUG. And we're achieving outcomes in many ways uh, that were exactly what we had intended. And we're doing so in the full light and in, in full engagement of, of citizens that, that want to be engaged. And that's really exciting. Um, and a lot of that was working at scale and, and working at a much faster pace than we had in the past. Um, secondly, you know, the why here, why now is that we have pathogens that are present that are, you know, um, we've been able to define that they weaken uh, these stands and then make them more susceptible to a host of different stressors, um, as well as um, potential infestations from, from other uh, bugs and crud. So we know that that's the case, and, and we know that we have proven silvicultural practices and forestry applications that can undermine the presence of that species in those stands and move those stands where we have the ability to actually practice forestry, which is not everywhere, move those stands in a direction um, that's going to reach the, the specific outcome, which I think you, sir, asked for. And, and that outcome is a, a resilient, intact forest with a, a healthy uh, age class diversity, uh, a healthy composition, which then functions uh, uh, as, as prime habitat for a variety of species, as well as a whole host of other ecosystem services around watershed health um, and, and climate change as well. So. But this is the thing I want to talk about, because you can read the letter and you can go through the project record and you can get really smart about what it is that I'm proposing and what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And the way you do that is you get out of the scoping notice and you get into these uh, proposed vegetation treatments. There's specific design features. There's a map that shows you where all of these activities are proposed to occur throughout the Taylor Basin. Um, and then there's also um, some other additional information that uh, that you can peruse. But I want to talk to you a little bit about something, sort of dial it back as far as why the Forest Service does what it does. 
And I would say for I, the last 10 years, this agency, maybe the last 15 years, has been uh, rhetorically speaking about increasing the pace and scale of restoration and resiliency enhancing treatments on our forests. And um, to achieve that, you have to plan at scale. So to achieve, uh, and then to you have to implement at scale, which means uses the very limited resources that we have to plan and the very limited resources we have to engage with the public um, in a way that's efficient and effective and leads to the desired outcomes uh, on the landscape that, that we are, are trying to achieve. Um, the second thing we've been talking a lot about as an agency for the last 20, 25 years is managing um, forests that exist in the wild or, uh, wildland urban interface or the WUI. This is those forests that come in contact with infrastructure um, that's important to the American people. That could be people's homes, that could be utility corridors, that could be range improvements for our robust um, you know, range program. Uh, and so managing in the WUI is an extremely important uh, option or um, outcome that the Forest Service is trying to focus on. This project in particular is hoping to achieve a whole host of ob objectives that will move those uh, through fuels treatments um, and thinning treatments and, and a range of different treatments, move those acres of forests that are adjacent to that infrastructure into a better position to be able to be, for it to be able to defend it against. And it also creates for the Forest Service opportunities, to potentially if the public sentiment were ever to move in the right direction to manage wildfire when it occurs naturally, as opposed to suppress it. Those anchor points, those those clearings, um, those all create options for firefighters, professional fire, wildland firefighters, to take different actions that are more indirect as opposed to direct, to protect firefighters, but also to allow fire to um, reestablish its natural um, role in the ecosystem. But all of that starts by protecting infrastructure and getting the American people and our communities here locally in Gunnison County ready for what is, you know, in many people's mind, a very scary concept, which is to not immediately throw, you know, 1,000 firefighters, 15 aircraft, and millions and millions of dollars at suppressing, you know, uh, a large mega fire, which just seems to be, if anyone, you know, was around last summer, a more and more prevalent uh, phenomenon in our intermountain forests. Okay. Now, most importantly, and I, I want to be, just be very frank about this, these are the suitable acres in our forest plan. And what I mean by suitable, they're suitable for managing for a, a sustainable uh, flow of timber for the American people. And we take very seriously our role as an economic driver in the forestry industry. Um, and we are lucky, in fact, I would say blessed in the, in the um, Western Colorado to have a vibrant forestry industry that continues to grow at the small scale, the post and pole uh, industry, as well as um, taking large um, wood for saw timber. Uh, the mill in Montrose was in receivership when I left Colorado six years ago. And now we have a vibrant mill that's growing its capacity and is creating immense opportunities, both economically for the local community, but also for the Forest Service to achieve objectives, not just here in the Gunnison District, but it also supports our work on the Uncompahgre Plateau. It supports the work going down uh, in pine forests in the San Juans, and it's going to support, uh, you know, additional markets as they present themselves um, both on private and public land. And so these projects that are proposing to treat roughly less than 5%, 4.8% of the total lodgepole stands on the district um, also has a, a, a unique economic driver that's very important to the multiple use mission of the Forest Service. So that's something I don't want to get lost in, in, in the, uh, the discussion is that the economic <coughs> effort is also very important and it's a core component of the business that I'm in. And at the end of the day, what we do is we keep forests in forests. Um, we battle against succession. We battle against um, other species that might want to you know, come in and, and um, turn our forests into pasture lands after wild, wildland fire or, or other treatments. We are in the business of trying to maintain a, a fabric of um, healthy, intact forested landscapes to continue to generate the immense ecological benefits um, as well as a whole host of other economic benefits that it can uh, generate in the long term. And um, the last thing I would just mention as far as like the why here, why now, 
is this is a focus for leadership. Um, the regional forester, who's like my boss's boss down in Denver, who I got to go see immediately after this meeting. I'm just walking and we still have blue sky, so Monarch should be well plowed and not terribly dangerous if I drive slow. Um, this is a focus, um, is increasing resiliency and, and maintaining resiliency in our forested landscapes throughout the Intermountain West uh, and the Rocky Mountain region. It's also a focus for our chief. It's also a focus for the state forester. Uh, you know, Mike Lester just came out, was quoted in an article today in the Denver Post that specifically discussed about how the, the lack of um, management, the lack of, uh, that we've just not taken the opportunities we have available to us with a, a, a local vibrant industry to, to practice sustainable, ecologically driven forestry in, in our forests. And it's, it's leading us down a road to, uh, to perpetuating this era of mega fires that we find ourselves in. And so um, if this is a focus, and this, is, this totally predates the current administration, because a lot of people think, oh, that's just because the president is the president and they're driving this. This started, um, I heard this, this discussion and this drive, um, you know, two chiefs before the current chief. So that's three administrations before the current. And um, what I'm trying to achieve as your local district rangers is two things. One, living up to doing what we said we were going to do uh, and, and, and putting some meat behind um, the rhetoric that you hear from the Forest Service at the national and regional level. But number two, engage local communities in that work, not just in the planning side, but also as importantly in the implementation side. Because at the end of the day, I want you to believe in me, not me like Matt and Combs, because I won't be here you know, for so long, but I want you to believe in the Forest Service and believe that our agency has your best interests at heart and that we are managing for current and future generations, and that we're managing for a reliable flow of water, abundant habitat, incredible recreation, world-class recreation opportunities, as well as a reliable flow of timber <laughs> Um, for the American people. So that's the larger piece. But I, don't, I think that gets lost because we try to convince you that this is the right thing to do um, for these scientific reasons. But I, I feel like it's important to talk about some of these larger policy related and social related issues because frankly, that's where we get stuck. And for whatever reason, the agency just does not do a very good job about standing up for its role in maintaining these landscapes, millions of acres across the United States that are, for the most part, in pretty darn good shape, and all of which have been actively managed and have had sustainable forestry applied to them since, you know, roughly the, the late 19th century. Clay? So, uh, I guess I would take a few minutes and talk a little bit about uh, what we do with Spedbear. Um, all, all the processes in Spedmere is what we call an environmental management system. It's a real simple process called plan, do, check, act. Uh, so we plan uh, both at the EIS scale and then we're planning now uh, individual treatments. Uh, every year during the planning phase, we meet with the public in the winter, usually in February. In this case, this year, because the furlough is going to come up on April 16th. We'll have our annual midwinter meeting. Uh, and we let the public know what we're doing for the next three years. They provide input to us, try to modify the, the treatments based on that input. And then every summer we have field trips. We take the public out there to see what we're doing, why we're doing it. And then uh, follow the field trips. Uh, we will actually have, also have a, what I call best management practice review. So each one of these treatments, we identify specific things that need to happen on the project to make sure we're protecting resources or achieving an outcome that we want to achieve. And, and we actually take the adaptive management group out there. We did this last summer. Uh, we take them to a project and we review it uh, to ensure that we've, what we've committed to do, we've done. Uh, last year, and I'm very proud of this, uh, out of a possible score of five, meaning we did really, really well. We got a 4.8 from this adaptive management group in terms of implementing a project as we said we're going to. Uh, and then because it's a longer term project, we have ongoing involvement of scientists. Uh, we have scientists from Colorado State University. Uh, Mike McCagley, who spoke to you earlier, is on our team. Uh, we have a lynx biologist from Colorado Parks and Wildlife involved with the effort. 
And we also have some social scientists involved in terms of economics that we're looking at over time. So this is this ongoing process and we actually, uh, when we get into implementation and we go out and check on the product, how we're doing and we learn from it and then we apply what we learn to next actions that we're planning at the end of the process. So every year I actually have our forest leadership team go through a process of reviewing what, what's working, what's not, and we make changes through, through the uh, truly adaptive management process. So, so so far it's worked very well. I think we've been very transparent with our adaptive management group. And in my mind, it actually has allowed the public to become more engaged in, in processes and, and uh, implementation of work that we've ever seen in the past. Usually we'll have an EA, we do the EA, we walk off and we implement the project. We don't ever talk to the public again. But with this process, it's an ongoing dialogue with the public as we implement the project. And so we're all learning together. So it is, it's a unique model. It's different than what we've seen in the past. Uh, but in my opinion, it's kind of the wave and, and the thing of the future for the Forest Service. To really truly engage scientists and the public during implementation on an ongoing basis. Thanks, Clay. And I just wanted one more thing, then we'll open up for questions. Okay, so, and the last thing I want to say is that this, un the, another unique component of this project is our engagement uh, with Western, with the Center for Public Lands, the Masters of Environmental Management, hopefully the Masters in Ecology program. Um, we have, uh, I'm a huge believer in what's going on at Western. And in our early dialogue about how we were going to work together, I had committed that the Gunnison District will be your laboratory. And so I handed them the most, the simplest project from the very beginning. A 250,000 acre planning area with 15,000 acres of forestry to be proposed in the busiest and most impacted recreation, motorized uh, motorized recreation mecca probably anywhere in the Intermountain West. And I just have to say, um, as we continue to move through, is how much I appreciate um, the work that uh, Maddie, Melanie, Jonathan, Emily, and Gabby, all of the, the, the students that have been part of it, as well as the faculty and some of the staff it's just fantastic. So um, I just want to acknowledge that this is a unique relationship that we're trying to cultivate um, so that uh, that as we work through these public and, and, and these environmental and um, policy processes that we're engaging the future leaders in the public lands management business um, as they cycle through the really unique and, and high quality programs here at West. So I just wanted to call that out as well and thank these guys for putting together another fantastic meeting. So that's all. Any questions? Not about that. They'd have to address those. <laughs> I had a quick comment, Matt. So I find our website is pretty confusing, or not confusing, but people always miss that there's tabs there right below project documents. So that supporting is another tab. So there's more documents under that. I just I just find that people have a hard time seeing those tabs. So I just wanted to point that out if you guys are exploring this website. And as There's the more project there. continues, this record will grow as well. Yeah, you'll get more tabs. And, and we're always available at any time. You can always call me, and I'll refer you to Pam, uh -huh. um, <laughs> to uh, to help interpret our our uh, internal processes. So the Spedmar process. Are there acres in Taylor Park that are covered under <coughs> that? There are some acres that are in the spruce stands that are covered. And in this proposal, it looked like there's mixed conifer forest. It has lodgepole, but also spruce. Correct. So are, are those two uh, desired treatments going to be similar? So I'll let our foresters speak to that. So the acres that we're proposing in this EA are not covered by SPEDMER, but the treatments in the spruce fir stands that we would do would kind of kind of mimic the resiliency treatments in SPEDMER, which is typically group selection. Um, Art could speak a little bit more, but um, in certain areas where we have SPEDMER units and Taylor Park units together, the treatments in spruce fir will, will look very similar. Questions. Well, 
I just want to thank you all again for being here on behalf of the Forest Service. It's fantastic for y'all to, to engage, and I really appreciate you the time this evening. If I don't get to see you before you leave, I just want to put that comment in the room. So thanks for showing up. Yeah, and a dovetail off of the conversation about um, Spedmere, at the next workshop, we want it to be more, we didn't get the breakout section, session, and so what we're looking for in this next round is going to be hearing from you guys about your values and your thoughts on the project as well as as matt was talking about forming a group here locally to really dive into some of the details so um i have some information from the folks at the spedmer group about a summary of you know how they got started what their scope was what they worked on so if you want to grab that on your way out um and then in a little bit greater detail, um, the one with the pictures on the front is actually um, an appendix in the final environmental impact statement that this um, Spedmere public group had in to tell and talk about how they were going to operate as a group through the implementation phase and monitoring and participating in the way that Clay, Clay talked about. So these are some materials for you guys to take home and learn about that um, Spedmere project in more depth. And then we'll talk about those at the um, workshop at the end of March and get some of the local feedback here. Hey, Maddie? Yeah, this, Clay. This is Clay. Yeah, just a couple of comments about those handouts. Um, what what the group did is they actually looked at collaborative processes throughout the West, and they pulled some of the best examples, and then they brought that information to bear, and then they put their own stamp on it. So this is this was was not original work from that group. Uh, they took it from lots of other models across the Western United States and then tailored it for themselves. So I just want to point that out. I think there's a lot of good work in there, and but it's based on collaborative processes throughout the whole Western United States. And thanks for adding that. And I think that segues into, there's also kind of a, a thought process that we're starting to kick off here of how would a group here locally want to work like that? And how could we create our own stamp on something? And so, um, there's an operating manual that the um, Spedmare group has, and so we have basically that, but a draft version where a little bit of it is changed for the location here. So if there are folks who consi are considering getting more involved and would like to look at it at that depth, this is a very initial stage of talking about what it might look like for that group to form and how it would operate. So these things are here to learn from examples and also start thinking about how to have that kind of unique stamp like Clay was just talking about for the Spedmere group, but here locally on the Taylor Park project. Uh, question for Matt, because sure. I didn't know we were we run out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. so, so like, um, can you just talk a little bit about um, the development of the, the EA, how this group here, folks like us, um, how the EA is going to reflect or not um, discussions that are coming up in this group? Because I fully, I, I have faith in the Forest Service in implementing this correctly and, and with uh, uh, stakeholders participating, and, and I don't doubt that. Um, I think it's, this is not new to you, this is something I've shared in the past, there's work that needs to be done or that I'd like to, to contribute on the, the front loading part, and how does how does that get heard uh, between now and the decision making process? And you can talk a little bit about sort of what the workshop approach will be, but I'll speak in general. So I'm 100% open. Um, so this, the project's in all transparency a little unique. So we we developed a lot of the the draft environmental impact or the draft EA is um, as proposed relatively complete, and that's because we used outside resources through our enterprise group, which is a set of Forest Service employees that comes in to help expedite projects for units. Um, and so, you know, that engine was already moving forward. And that's where, again, I was like optimistic. You'd be like, yeah, it's perfect. So let's really all focus on implementation. But I obviously understand that perhaps folks in the room or, or folks not in the room, communities that may be represented by some of you here have concerns about the way the project's proposed as written. And I think that a function of this group much like the function of, of what ultimately became the Spedmere AMG, um, that we we are 
we are committed to collaborating around some of these issues that, that folks want to raise and trying to address them through structural changes in the decision itself. Um, in addition, uh, the, the draft EA, what, what I forget what our goal is to release that. April 1st. April 1st, the draft is written will be released for um, an official comment period to give people an opportunity to review it as well as to provide comments should they want to establish standing for a potential objection in the long run. So um, that'll be available to this group and that'll be available to the general public. And I expect to hear a range of feedback and comments and all of those comments will be responded to like we do in every single environmental analysis. So that folks have a, our rationale, my rationale um, as to, as to uh, how those concerns have been addressed are not relevant to the project or how the, those concerns um, are leading to specific changes in the project. So between now and, and hopefully we reach a decision later this summer, um, we'll facilitate those conversations. And I think the way that the workshops that uh, Western's developed, some are designed to, to wrestle with some of those questions. Um, and then I also encourage you to like, if you have standalone concerns that you want to address with the Forest Service directly, you can do that at any point in time by contacting me and setting up a time to chat. Um, so that's kind of my vision. The thing I would also put out there though, is that, um, I want to make a decision this summer so we can't take too long. Collaboration inherently, especially in its earliest inceptions took a lot of time. Um, and I feel like because of the, the excellent work that we have to model in the Spendmere process, as well as the excellent work that's already been done on the development of the project that hopefully we can refine around some of those concerns that I know you share, and uh, specifically Matt, um, as well as other concerns that might come up from the community or other members of, that, um, that want to participate in the group. So, so I'm just being honest with you, I want to sign a decision this summer so that I can start marking and prepping these sales for future offer um, in the near term. That's an obligation I have to my organization as the land manager here in Gunnison <laughs> County. So, uh, does that answer your question? Yes. <clears throat> Just a follow-on question to that. Um, it sounds like our mechanism then for um, getting our concerns out there will be the workshop and then comments on the EA. Absolutely. Those will be the, so there's the, the formal and sort of informal, and I'll take both equally seriously. Um, I think what's ex what could be exciting about wrestling with some of those questions within an adaptive management group as it forms is that we get to kind of all hear um, the conversation. And again, some of that shared learning uh, can occur because this is not the end of vegetation management in the Gunnison Ranger District. Uh, you know, we, we are moving out in a very aggressive fashion on the, on the available spruce stands. When I say available, I mean things that we can access that are currently in our suitable base under the forest plan to try to affect as much change as we possibly can um, and accelerate that um, that new generation of spruce trees. Taylor Park really represents, in many cases, um, you know, a it's somewhat of a drawdown in in the meditation management of, um, of of the available stands because there just aren't that many left. We'll continue, uh, like with the Monarch Marshall C, to look at places where we can we can achieve some um, protection. But I'll be pivoting very hard as far as my future uh, vegetation management program in the district to fuels management, um, and where, which will have a commercial component because it has to, otherwise it's just not viable. But um, but really, I'm looking to this group to hopefully live beyond just the Taylor Park project and really get a core uh, group of stakeholders and stakeholder-based organizations, perhaps, or communities that are committed to sort of walking with the agency, walking with the district on, on a project development, project implementation well into the future. And it doesn't have to be always the same people. You're not committing for life. But if you can, I wouldn't hold it against you. <laughs> Any other questions to, with regards to what Matt addressed? Okay, Kevin, no? You're just scratching your head. You're like, okay. Okay, well, um, again, there's these materials to um, take with you to think a little bit more about that speedmer process and how that could be reflected here. And um, next time we will have a little bit more, as Matt said, an opportunity to start grappling with those questions about the project. 
Um, so thank you all for coming here and staying late on a Monday after daylight savings. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And if anyone is interested in sharing with other folks, we'll get the video posted to our Center for Public Lands website um, tonight or tomorrow, so you can share it and folks can join in the distance conversation on Thursday. <laughs> yes, and if there are folks who weren't here tonight that you think could be. Um, interested, let them know about the Thursday option to join virtually or um, the other dates at the end of the month.